Okay, so in this talk, I'm going to go over the basic motivation behind the definition of the off limit. Uh, not so much the detailed epsilon delta, but just your intuitive idea and a few somewhat non intuitive aspects of that. So here I have the notation limit as x approaches c of fx. Well, it's written like this limit. Under the limit, we write where the domain thing goes. So x is approaching a, a value c, and c could be an actual number. x, however, will always be a variable letter. So this x will not be a number, c could be a number like 0, 1, 2, 3 or something. f of x, f is a function, okay, and we are saying that as x approaches some, some number c, f of x approaches some number l, and that's what's limit as x approaches c of f x is l. Okay, now what does this mean? Well, roughly what it means is that as x is coming closer and closer to c, f x is sort of hanging around L. It's coming closer and closer to L. Okay? So, by the way, there are two senses in which the word limit is used in the English language. One meaning is limit in this approach sense, which is the mathematical meaning of limit. There is another sense in which the word limit is used in the English language, which is limit as a boundary, or as a cap, or as a bound. Say, there is a limit to how many uh, uh, apples you can eat from the fruit bowl or something and that that sense of limit is not used for that sense of limit we do not use the word limit in mathematics for that sense of limit we use the word bound b-o-u-n-d so in mathematics we reserve the use of the word limit only for this approach sense okay just so we don't get confused in mathematics okay so so, as I said, it's the idea is that as x approaches c, fx approaches l. So, as x is coming closer and closer to c, the distance between x and c is becoming smaller and smaller. The distance between fx and l is also roughly becoming smaller and smaller. Now, this doesn't quite work unless your function is increasing or decreasing a or c. So, you could have various complications with oscillatory functions. So, so the point is this, this notion doesn't really it's not really clear what we mean here without further elaboration, without a clear-cut definition. Okay? Now, I'm going to sort of move up toward the definition. Now, before we go there, I want to say that there is a graphical concept of limit, which you may have seen in school, or if you've seen limits in school, which hopefully you have this video sort of more a review type than than learning it for the first time. So let, let's try to understand this from a graph point of view. So let's say you have a function whose graph looks something like this. So this is x is c. So this, this uh, is the value x is c. And this is the graph of the function. These curves are the graph of the function. So for x less than c, the graph is this along this curve. For x greater than c, the graph is uh, this curve. So x less than c, the graph is this curve. x greater than c, the graph is this curve. And at x equal to c, the value is that uh, fill dot. Okay. Now you can see from here that as x is approaching c from the left, so, uh, so if you take values of x which are slightly less than c, the function values, so are, so the points on the graph are these, the function values are the respective y coordinates. This is x, this is y, the graph y is fx. So, when x is to the immediate left of c, the value, y value, or the y equals fx value is, are, are these values. So, this or this, and, and as x approaches c from the left, the y values are approaching the y coordinate of this open circle. Okay? So, in, in a sense, if you just were looking at the limit from the left for x approaching c from the left, then the limit would be the y coordinate of this open circle. 
Okay, now you can also see as x approaches c from the right, so approaches from here, the y coordinate is approaching the y coordinate of this thing, this, this uh, open circle on top. So, so there are actually two concepts here, there's a left hand limit is this value, we'll call this L1 and the right hand limit is this value L2. So the left hand limit, which is the notation is limit as x approaches c from the left of fx is L1. The right hand limit from the right, that's plus of fx is L2. And the value f of c is some third number. You don't know what it is, but f of c, L1, L2 are in this case, all different. Now, what does this mean as far as the limit is concerned? Well, the concept of limit is really a concept of two-sided limit, which means that in this case, the limit as x approaches c of fx does not exist because you have a left-hand limit and you have a right-hand limit and they are not equal to each other. The value as such doesn't matter. So whether the value exists, what it is, doesn't affect this concept of limit. But the, the real problem here is that the left hand limit and right hand limit are not equal. The left hand limit is here, the right hand limit is, is up here. Okay, now, uh, so, so, so this graphical interpretation, you see the graphical interpretation is sort of that for the left hand limit, you basically sort of follow the graph on the immediate left and see where it's headed to and look at the y coordinate of that. And for the right hand limit, you follow the graph on the right and see where that's headed to and look at the, at the y coordinate of that. And so here, so let me make an example where the limit does exist. Let's say you have you have a picture something like this. Okay, so in this case, the left hand limit and right hand limit are the same thing, so this number, but the value is something different. Now you could also have a situation where the value doesn't exist at all. The function isn't defined at the point, but the limit still exists because the left hand limit and right hand limit are the same. Now all these examples, there's a sort of a crude way of putting putting this idea, which is called the two-finger test. You may have heard it in some slightly different names. The two-finger test idea is that you use one finger to trace the curve on the immediate left and see where that's headed to and you use another finger to trace the curve on the immediate right and see where that's headed to and if your two fingers come to meet each other then then the place where they meet the y coordinate of that is the limit if, however, they do not come to meet each other, which happens in this case, one of them is here, one is here, then the limit doesn't exist because the left-hand limit and right-hand limit are not equal. Okay? So this hopefully you have seen in great detail in uh, whenever you've done limits in detail in school. Okay? However, what I want to say here is that this two-finger test is not really a good definition of limit. Well, what's the problem? The problem is that, you know, you could have really crazy functions and it's really hard to move your finger along the graph of the function, okay? If the function sort of jumps around a lot, it's really hard and, and it doesn't really solve any problem. It, it, it's not really a mathematically clear thing. It's like, you know, it's... It's like trying to answer a mathematical question using a physical description, which is sort of the wrong type of answer. So while this is very good for a basic intuition, for very simple type of functions, it's not actually the correct idea of limit. Okay. So, so what kind of things could, could give us trouble? Why do we need to refine our understanding of limit? Well, the main thing is functions which have a lot of oscillation. Let me do an example. So, 
So the point is, I'm, I'm now going to write down a, a type of function where, where in fact, you have to develop a clear cut concept of limit to be able to answer this question precisely. Okay, so this is a graph of a function sine 1 over x. Now this looks a little weird. Okay, it's not 1 over sine x, that would just be cosecant x, but it's not that, it's sine of 1 over x. Okay, and obviously the, for this function itself is not defined at x equals 0. But just the fact that that's not defined isn't good enough for us to say the limit doesn't exist. We actually have to try to make a picture of this and try to understand what the limit is going to be. Okay, so let's first make the picture of sine x. Sine x looks like that. Okay, periodic. Now, how will sine 1 over x look? Well, let, let's start off when x is near infinity. When x is very large positive, then 1 over x is near 0, slightly positive, just slightly bigger than 0, okay? And sine 1 over x is therefore slightly positive. So it's, it's like here. So it's going to start off with an asymptote, a horizontal asymptote at 0, okay? Then it's going to sort of go, go this path, but much more slowly reach 1, then it's going to go this path, but in reverse, so like that, okay, then it's going to go this path, but now it does all these oscillations, all of these oscillations, it has to do faster and faster, okay, so for instance, this is pi, this is 1 over pi, then this is 2 pi, this number is 1 over 2 pi, then the next time it reaches uh, 0 will be 1 over 3 pi and so on. So what's going to happen is that near 0, it's going to be crazily oscillating between minus 1 and 1 and the, and the frequency of the oscillation keeps getting faster and faster as you come closer and closer to 0. The same type of picture on the left side as well, it's just, in fact it's an odd function. So it's this kind of picture. Now, now I'll make, it, make a bigger picture here. I'll make a bigger picture on another one. So all these oscillations should be between minus 1 and 1 and they get faster, so they get faster and faster and now my pen is too thick, right? This is the same, even if you use your finger instead of the pen to trace it, it will be too thick. It's called the thick finger problem. Okay, I'm not, I'm not being very accurate here, but just to, the idea. The pen or finger is too thick, but actually there's a very thin line, I mean it's infinitely thin line of the graph which goes like that. Now, let's go back, get back to our question. What is limit as x approaches 0 sine 1 over x? Now, I want you to think about this a bit, okay? Think about like the finger test. You move your finger around, going like this, this, this. You, it's sort of getting close to zero, but still not quite reaching it, right? It's where are you headed? It's kind of a little unclear. So, so notice it's not that that just because we plug in zero it doesn't make sense. The limit doesn't exist. That's not the issue. The issue is that after you make the graph, it's unclear what's happening. Now one, one kind of logic is that yeah, the limit is zero. Why? Well, it's kind of balanced around zero, right? It's a bit above, a bit below, and it keeps coming close to zero, right? So at any number of the form x is 1 over n pi, sine 1 over x is zero. So it keeps coming close to zero, right? As x approaches zero, this number 
keeps coming close to zero. So if you think of limit as something it's approaching, then as x approaches zero, sine one over x is sort of coming close to zero. Is it? Well, it's definitely coming near zero, right? Any anything you make around zero, any uh, ball, small disk you make around zero, the graph is going to enter that. On the other hand, it's not really staying close to zero, right? It's kind of oscillating between minus one and one. However small uh, interval you take around zero on the x thing, the function is oscillating between minus one and one. So it's not staying faithful to zero. So now you have kind of this question, what should be the correct definition of this limit? Should it mean, should it mean that it, it, it sort of approaches the point, but maybe goes in and out, close and far, or should it mean it approaches and stays close to the point? And that is like a judgment you have to make in the definition. And it so happens that people who tried defining this chose the latter idea, that is it should come close and stay close. So that's actually key idea number two we have here. The function, for, for a function to have a limit at a point, the function needs to be trapped near the limit close to the point in the domain. Okay. So this is therefore, it doesn't have a limit at zero because the function is oscillating too wildly. It, you cannot trap it. You cannot trap the function values so you cannot say that you know you cannot trap the function value say in in a small horizontal strip near zero you cannot trap it near zero. so that means the limit cannot be zero but the same logic works anywhere else so the limit cannot be half because you cannot trap the function in a small horizontal strip about half whereas x approaches zero so we'll actually talk about this example in great detail in a future video after we've seen the formal definition. But the, the key idea you need to remember is that the function doesn't just need to come close to the point it's limiting, it actually needs to stay close, it needs to be trapped near the point. The other important idea regarding limits is that the limit depends only on the behavior very, very close to the point. Now, what do we mean by very, very close? Now, if you were working in like, like the real world, you may say, well, it's like, think of some really small number and you say that much distance from it. So let's say I'm, I want to calculate the limit as X approaches two. Just write that so I want to calculate, let's say, limit as x approaches 2 of some function, you may say, well, we sort of, what's close enough? Is 2.1 close enough? I don't know, that's too far. What about 2.0000001? Is that close enough? Now, if you weren't a mathematician, you would probably say, yeah, this is close enough, right? I mean, the difference is like, or so it's uh, 10 to the minus 7, right? Okay, so, so to, it's a really, sm it's really, really close to 2 compared to our usual sense of numbers, but as far as mathematics is concerned, both of these numbers are really far from 2. Any individual number that's not 2 is very far from 2. What do I mean by that? Well, think back to one of our pictures. So here's a picture. Now, suppose I, I, I take some point. So let's say this is two. And suppose I take one point here, which is really close to two. And I just change the value of the function at that point. Okay, so I change the value of the function at that point, or I just change the entire picture of the graph from that point rightward. So I just take this picture and I change it to, let's say, so I replace this picture by that picture. Okay, 
or I replace the picture by some totally new picture like that picture. So I just changed the part of the graph to the right of some point like 2.000001 z whatever. Okay. Will that affect the limit at 2? No. Because the limit at 2 really depends only on the behavior really really close. So if you if you take any fixed point which is not 2 and you change the behavior sort of at that point or farther away than that point, then the behavior close to 2 doesn't get affected. Okay. So so that's that's the other key idea here. Okay, so actually I did these in reverse order. So that's how it was coming naturally. But I'll just say them again. So the limit depends on the behavior arbitrarily close to the point. It doesn't depend on the behavior at any single specific other point. It just depends on the behavior as you approach the point and any other point is far away. It's only sort of together that all the other points matter and it's only the them getting really close that matters. The other thing is that the function actually needs to be trapped near the point for, for the limit notion to be true. So this type of picture where it's oscillating between minus 1 and 1, however close you get to 0, keeps oscillating and so you cannot trap it around any point. So you cannot uh, trap the function value in any small enough uh, strip. In that case, the limit doesn't exist. Okay. So we'll in subsequent videos we'll see the epsilon delta definition. We'll do a bit of formalism to that, and then we'll come back to to some of these issues later with the formal understanding. Okay.